This video is about some of your limit theorems that you might remember from Calc 1. So we'll prove a few of them. So we're going to say that a sequence xn is bounded if there exists a natural number m such that the absolute value of any term in your sequence is at most m. So all terms in your sequence and absolute value have to be at most m. Remember the absolute value is just kind of quickly saying it's both bounded above and below. So to give you some examples, something like xn equals 1 over n, that's a bounded sequence. It's bounded by 1, right? It never gets higher than 1. Um, something like, uh, or absolute value of 1 over n never gets higher than 1 is what I mean. Something like the sequence just n, just the natural numbers, that's not bounded, right? For any, any fixed m that you had, you could always find a natural number in your sequence that's bigger than that particular m, so not bounded. So what we care to look at and prove, our first thing we'll prove in this video, is that a convergent sequence is always going to be bounded. And let me draw you a picture about maybe why that is. So I'll go back to this two-dimensional drawing of a sequence here. So if I know that xn is convergent, then I know that these dots have to kind of level off to L as I go farther and farther to the right. And so here's the idea for why is this sequence bounded um, over here. You know, maybe I've picked n large enough so that I could put this window around these points and the red dots never jump out of that window. And uh, I could pick n so that maybe this window has length one from L, right? So for any length that I picked, I know I could go far enough to the right to make sure that every red dot to the right fits inside of this window. So let's say for one here. So then what am I saying to you? Well, in this case, these red dots are all bounded by L plus one. But then if I look before that, right? So that takes care of all these dots that are this way. What if I look before that and maybe what's left? Why don't I just pick the highest one, right? So that would be in my picture here, X3 would be the highest of all those. So then what would be a good number M that bounds every point in my sequence? It'll just be whatever's bigger, either the tallest point you had in this part or L plus one. So that's kind of a picture of what we're gonna try to do, what we're gonna try to prove. So how do we write that idea out formally? So I'll zoom out a little bit more. I'll erase some of my drawings here. And let's do the proof. So suppose that xn converges to this number L. So if epsilon is equal to one, then there exists some natural number so that for every n past that, I know that each point in my sequence has at most distance one from L. Remember that is what this says right here. So what do I want again? Well, I wanna make sure that xn is smaller than or equal to something, some number m, some fixed number m. So I'll start with xn here and we'll do a famous math trick, which is to add zero inside. So I have sneakily added zero there, minus L plus L. Now, why am I gonna do that? Well, I know something about absolute value of xn minus L, and hey, I see part of that right here. I'd love to split up this absolute value, so we'll apply the triangle inequality to do that. So now that I've applied the triangle inequality, I know that this is smaller than one by hypothesis, so that altogether, this whole expression now is smaller than or equal to one plus uh, absolute value of L. And remember what I'm saying to you is I can make sure that all my points to the right of that N never get higher than one plus absolute value of L. So this is how we've written formally that idea, that picture. So now what we still need to do is take care of, again, points before that, right? And the good news is, is that, well, there is only, there's only N points to the left, right? There's only n points I need to think about to the left. So why don't I just let b just be the, the highest of those, the highest of the absolute value of each of those. And so again, what I'm doing is I'm gonna say b in my picture over here, b would be just x3. That would be the same thing as absolute value of x3 in my picture over here. And so again, just to recap here, I'm saying that I've listed out all the points in my sequence right here. And what I said that, well, for these, the most that that could be is B. And then now for these, the most that these could be is L, absolute value of L plus one. So that what can I make sure that all of these are less than just whichever one of these is bigger. And so what I'll do is I'll let M just be the supremum. You could probably say max here instead of supremum. Um, anyway though, supremum was fun. We'll say B, M is the supremum of B and one plus L. So that in particular, absolute value of XN is always less than or equal to that M. So that proves that your sequence is bounded. So let's talk about our limit laws. So to set this up, let's say that I have three sequences, xn, yn, and zn, and let's say that they all converge, xn converges to x, yn converges to y, and zn converges to z. And finally, let's just let c be any real number. So the first limit law, the limit of the sum or difference of two sequences should just be the sum or difference of the limits. 
the limit of a product should be the product of the limits. Uh, sorry, these should have XNs on them right there. So then uh, what else here? Um, the limit of some constant multiple times a sequence should just be that multiple times the limit. So in other words, this multiple should come outside, that scalar multiple, if you wanna use that fancy word. And then finally, if you can guarantee that uh, each, each uh, term Zn in that sequence is non-zero, and if the limit's non-zero, then we could do quotients too. The limit of Xn over Zn should just be the limit of the top over the limit of the bottom. And again, we're just making sure here that we're never, that this expression's never something over zero and that this is never zero. Remember, you can never have zero in a denominator. All right, so I'm only gonna prove number one of these that the, and I'll just do the sum and then the difference is pretty similar. So how would you do that? So what I wanna remind you of is, if I wanna show that uh, xn plus yn converges to x plus y, I need to show you that there's an n large enough so that this difference here in absolute value is less than epsilon. And so what we'll typically do again is we'll play with what's the thing in absolute value. And maybe a strategy is to get the x's and the y's you know, together separately. So let's do that. So I've put xn and x next to each other and I've put y and y next to each other. And then now what I wanna do is again, use the triangle inequality, inequality to split those up into two pieces. Now, what do I know about xn minus x? Well, I know that xn converges to x. Therefore, I can make sure that n's big enough so that, I mean, this difference could be as small as I want it to be. Similarly, yn minus y, well, that can be made as small as I like too, just by going sufficiently far to the right with my n. Because again, yn converges to y. So if I wanna make sure that this is all less than epsilon, and I can make these as small as I want, why don't I make them both just less than epsilon over two? So I'm gonna make each of those less than epsilon over two, because this would be less than, add those together, you get the epsilon that you want. So that's the strategy, that's what we'll try to do. So how do we put this together? So again, that's our plan. What's kind of the formal proof look like? Well, you start with, let's let epsilon be larger than zero. Since the xn's converge to x, you know that there exists some number, I'll call it n1, such that for every index larger than that, I can make sure that my sequence is within epsilon over two of x. Similarly, since the yn's converge to y, I know that there's some other natural number, n2, such that, if n's big enough, then the yn's are within epsilon over two of y. And then now what I'll do, I'll just say, if I pick a natural number then that's larger than either of these, right? So for every natural number larger than both of those, I get these two results simultaneously, right? And I can use that to my advantage now to do my triangle inequality trick. So again, remember, our aim is to show that this is less than epsilon. Now we just repeat our triangle inequality trick from which, from here, and from here, we're about to conclude that these are both less than epsilon over two, and therefore that's equal to epsilon. And again, we have that xn plus yn is within epsilon of x plus y. That's what we wanted to show. The other parts are kind of similar. Some are a little bit more involved, but I invite you to try those. Once you talk about some more results with you uh, from this section somewhere, oh, there we go. So if uh, xn, Maybe, can I push? No, I can't, okay. If uh, you have a sequence that's always non-negative, uh, and if it converges to some number x, well then the limit's gotta be non-negative also. Yeah, and I pushed undo a little bit too many times here. So let's look at what, what does this say? So if I've got a sequence, my red points, right? And the red points never ever dip below the x-axis, right? They're never ever negative. Well then, and these also are, are assumed to level off at some point. What this is saying is just where they level off at has to be above the x-axis also. So maybe what we would try to do is, well, how would I prove that? Let's try proof by contradiction. So what if they leveled off somewhere down here? I mean, you kind of see that would be ridiculous, but what would that look like? Well, that would mean that eventually all the points in my sequence would need to be negative, which contradicts the fact that all the points in my sequence themselves are positive, right? These points that I've highlighted down here can't exist. So that's the basis of this proof. So use the picture to help you write a proof. So by way of contradiction, suppose that the limit x is negative. Let's let epsilon be equal to negative x. So in that case, what can I say? I could, make, I could find an n so that for all indices larger than that, I can assure you that xn is within that epsilon of the limit x. And so uh, in this case, 
what I'm gonna do is rearrange some stuff. So if I get minus xn by itself in the middle, I'm gonna subtract x to both sides. And what else am I gonna do? Well, I know that epsilon's the same thing as minus x. So that uh, in this case here, um, what am I gonna get? I get zero, right? These are opposites of each other then because of that. And then over here, this would give me two epsilons, right? If minus x is epsilon, then you got two of them over there. So now let's divide each of these by the negative, which will flip these inequalities around. So I get that minus two epsilon is less than xn, which is less than zero. But wait a minute. That says that the terms of my sequence are negative, but that's ridiculous because I suppose that they're always positive. And again, that's our contradiction. That's this part of the picture down here that's false. So that's a contradiction again, since xn is always non-negative. So thus the limit x had to be non-negative as well. So the next result, if uh, you have two sequences, if xn is always less than or equal to yn for every single uh, natural number, then, and also, sorry, so and if both sequences converge, well then the limits have to obey the same inequality. x has to be less than y as well. I'll try to draw you a picture. Why should this be believable as well? So, so far, let's say that my xn's are in red and my yn's are in blue there. So how, how you should uh, look at this picture, right, is the blue point here is always above the red. So for the second index, blue is always above. So if the blue always has to be above the red, and then again, what uh, these two conditions say is that eventually both of these have to level off. Well, if I draw that in, the x's, the xn's level off there, then yes, the yn's have to level off above there. And that's all really that this is trying to say to you right here. So how do we prove that? What we'll try to do is just use the result we just did above. So why don't I let zn be the difference of the two sequences that I have? And so what do you notice? Well, if yn is always bigger than xn, then zn should always be positive, or I guess I should say non-negative. And now what we'll also do is we'll also notice that I know what the limit of the difference of two sequences is, it should just be the difference of the limits, so y minus x. And then now we can use the above uh, result that we just proved, that's if you have got a non-negative sequence, then the limit has to be non-negative also. So y minus x has to be greater than or equal to zero. Finally, just add this x to the other side. And you get that y is larger than or equal to x, which is what we wanted right here, and which justifies our picture. I think I've got one more theorem for you before a few examples. So the squeeze theorem. If you've got three sequences, xn, yn, and zn, where they satisfy these inequalities, xn's always on the bottom, yn's always in the middle, zn is always on the top is what this says. And let's suppose that the outside ones, xn and zn, both converge to the same number L. Well, the squeeze theorem says the middle one has to converge to L as well. So let me try to draw you a picture of that. So, so far, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plot xn in red and zn in blue now. If they both have to converge to that yellow line, so as you go farther to the right, you see these points start to get closer and closer to that yellow line. Well, if yn is green and the yn's always have to fit between these two, then necessarily the green points have to get close to the yellow as well. That's what this uh, squeeze theorem, another word for this is sandwich theorem in different books. So how would you prove this a little bit more formally? But then again, that's the, that's the idea. Let's let epsilon be a positive number. I'm gonna use the fact that uh, because xn and zn both converge to the same number L, I know that I can find an index in my, uh, a large enough integer, or sorry, a large enough natural number so that all the terms in the sequences xn and zn are both within epsilon of this limit L. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to maybe parse out what each of these mean a little bit more. So this one tells me this much here, xn minus L is between minus epsilon and epsilon. And what I've highlighted for you is a part that I'm gonna use in a little bit. And similarly, this tells me that, well, zn minus L is definitely less than or equal to absolute value of zn minus L, and that's less than epsilon. So I'm gonna use that in a minute too. So I'm going to use my assumption now that yn is always between these two, xn and zn. Why don't I subtract L from every single piece of that inequality? I should still get those inequalities there, and then now you see I've brought my colors in, I'm gonna use these relationships. Well, I know that this is always larger than negative epsilon. And then similarly, the orange up here, this tells me Zn minus L is less than epsilon. So I can stick a less than epsilon over on this side. And that's really all that I'm gonna do. 
So what do I get? I get that the middle, yn minus l, is between minus epsilon and epsilon, which is equivalent to saying that yn is always within epsilon of l as long as n is large enough. So that is the proof of the squeeze theorem. So the last thing that I want to say, what we've just done is we've used this epsilon, epsilon definition of a limit just to justify a lot of the rules that maybe you took for granted and just used in like a kind of Calc 1 class where you're doing a lot of computations. So, I mean, now that we have those, right, how do you actually do these limits? You've got those rules now. So you just justify that, yes, this is how I can compute limits. So like to compute the limit of this, I'll just divide each piece by n, then I'll simplify. And uh, what I'll do then is I'll look at that 2 over n there. I can take the limit of the top and I could take the limit of the bottom. That's one of my limit laws. And I see that, well, 2 over n goes to 0, therefore this limit is just 1 third. Similarly, I could try to show now that sine of n over n goes to 0. So how come? Well, what do you know about sine? You know that the biggest it could be is 1, and the smallest it could be is negative 1. So it's bounded by 1. So equivalently, it's what I just said, it's between negative one and one. So what do I care about? Sine's cool. I care about sine of n divided by n. Why don't I just divide each piece of this inequality by n now? And so if I do that, it looks like this. And then now what do you notice? Well, let's think about limits now. What happens is n gets big. Well, that goes to zero, but on the far right, that goes to zero too. So if the outer two sides go to zero, what's the middle have to do? The squeeze theorem tells me that the limit of sine of n over n, the middle, also has to go to zero.